the last Maharaja of the Sikh nation, whose own faith and identity were tested to the limit. His name, Maharaja Dalip Singh. Born a royal prince of the Punjab in the age of Queen Victoria, he lost the empire he was destined to inherit and was exiled to Britain as a teenager. Favoured by Queen Victoria, he converted to Christianity and lived the life of an English gentleman. But gradually, he rediscovered his Sikh heritage and was baptised back into the Sikh faith. Dressed in his turban and jewels, this shadowy image is the young Maharaja Dilip Singh, the last ruler of the Sikh empire. He's just 10 years old, captured by an amateur photographer in Lahore in 1848. Now part of Pakistan, Lahore was then the royal seat of power in an independent Punjab. Dalit's father was the charismatic Ranjit Singh, known as the Lion of the Punjab. And his mother, Rani Jindan, the last of Ranjit's many wives, renowned for her ambition and beauty. But Dalit Singh never got the chance to make his own mark in history as a great Sikh ruler. With his mother holding the reins of power as regent after his father died, he stayed on the throne for just six years. By the time he was 11, his kingdom had been absorbed into British India. His future? Uncertain. The deposed boy prince was separated from his mother and taken to Fatiga on the banks of the Ganges. It was 140 miles from Lahore and famous for its Christian missionary work. He was placed in the care of a British couple, Dr. John Logan, a surgeon in the Bengal army, and his wife, Lady Lena Logan. On the 8th of March, 1853, Dilip was baptized into the Christian faith, the first Indian prince to convert. To emphasize his commitment, the leap broke one of the sacred vows of Sikhism. His hair was cut and he presented it braided to his British guardian. Uncut hair was one of the five articles of faith ordered by Guru Gobind Singh when he created the Sikh Brotherhood of the Khalsa. For Sikhs, it's seen as a symbol of respect for the perfection of God's creation. Having moved away from his Sikh faith, Dilip, aged just 15, left his Sikh homeland as an exile. Just a few days after the celebration of the Saki, on the 19th of April 1854, he boarded a ship for Britain and disembarked into an alien environment. Dilip was a very isolated young man, trying to work out where he fitted in. Treated as an exotic outsider, his royal status opened the doors to high society. Within weeks of his arrival, he was introduced to Queen Victoria. In private, the leap had taken to his aristocratic lifestyle. But in public, he was expected to present himself as an Indian prince. Caught between two identities, gentlemen about town and deposed Sikh Maharaja, the leap was happy to accept his lot. And that might have been the end of the story, but for a meeting in 1861. By the age of 22, the leap had been separated from his mother for 13 years. During that time, Rani Jindan had been imprisoned by the British, but escaped and continued to plot for the return of her son's birthright. The leap now asked if he could meet her. The British no longer considered the frail and nearly blind Jindan a threat, and so the leap set sail for a reunion in a Calcutta hotel. Mother and son moved into Mulgrave Castle in Whitby, and Jindan began to open the leap's mind to his heritage and to seek values. But in 1863, tragedy struck. Just two years after their emotional reunion, Rani Jindan died. The leap was 24 years old.
Philippe continued his British lifestyle. He also married Bamba Muller, a Christian he'd met in Cairo on his travels, and she joined him in his newly purchased sprawling estate in Elfden, Suffolk. Here the seed that his mother had sown began to show, a reconnection with his long-neglected Sikh roots. Inspired by his mother, the methods the leap used in pursuit of justice echoed the teaching of the 10th Guru, Gobind Singh, who had taught the importance of an exhaustive approach of appeal. Up to this point, the leap had campaigned alone, but now he enlisted the help of his Sikh family and supporters in India. It set alarm bells ringing in government circles. Alongside his political campaigning, the leap showed a growing interest in being reinitiated into the Sikh faith. The leap was beginning to mould his Sikh identity. But he also had an eye on the future, on the next generation. The 1881 census lists the Leap's growing family, three daughters and three sons. The Leap's growing religious and political convictions had begun with the powerful voice of his mother 20 years before. Everything since then had been about getting to this pivotal moment in his life. The Leap wrote to Queen Victoria, I did not wish that you, my sovereign, should hear from any other source but myself of the possibility of my re-embracing the faith of my ancestors. The Leap abandoned Elfden Hall, sold its contents, and at the end of March 1886, set sail for India to reclaim his sovereignty and to be baptized back into the Sikh faith. The Leap Singh's journey had two goals one political and one personal. Politically, he'd turned his back on Britain in search of support for his claim on the Punjab. Whilst personally, he planned on arrival in India to be baptised back into the Sikh religion of his birth. The British government did not want him to get to India at all. It was while under house arrest that the leap became a Sikh in a baptism ceremony performed on the morning of the 25th of May, 1886. Many Sikhs choose to take Amrit during the Vasaki festival as a commitment to worship one God, to read the Guru Granth Sahib and to serve others. Whilst his personal journey of rediscovery had been fulfilled, the Leap's political ambitions remained elusive. Prevented from travelling to the Punjab by the British authorities, he travelled instead to Europe to plan his future. Two months after his Amrit ceremony, he wrote a letter to a boyhood friend, its light-hearted tone at odds with its darker message. I style myself lawful monarch of the Sikh nation. Doesn't that sound grand, my boy? The only thing I have settled on doing, as I am a Sikh now, is to fight the administration of India to the last and create all the mischief I can in India. Fancy our meeting on the battlefield, but I promise you, should it ever come to pass, the first shot... But the first shot was never fired, and the leaped life was coming to a close. He spent the final seven years of his life talking with dissident, anti-British groups from Russia and Ireland. But his involvement in complex intrigues and plots ultimately came to nothing. At 52, his obsessive quest had cost him his marriage and his health.
1999, the Prince of Wales unveiled a bronze statue of the Maharaja close to Elfton Hall, the Leap's old home. It's a mark of his importance in Anglo-Sikh history as the Punjab's last Maharaja and Britain's first Sikh settler.